We are back on uh, Monday, January 23rd. It's a snow day here. Uh, I'm Patrick Cody of Kimo Valley TV, and I'm joined once again by Tisha Buss, uh, state rep for Woodstock, Plymouth, and Reading. Welcome, Tisha. Thank you for coming back. Thanks for having me back. And uh, and so how are you uh, spending this, this snow day there in Woodstock? <laughs> Well, I've already been on a Zoom call with Legislative Council to uh, to talk about exemptions or employment protections uh, with schools, and 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 now that we will be giving um, state dollars towards tuitions um, with faith based schools, we have to look at what is called ministerial exception and compelled speech. So this is sort of like a course in law school, except I'm just getting it all as a legislator. So, um, you know, just light topics to wake up to on a Monday morning. (laughs) Get the week started off on the right foot, right? Just that's, That's, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Just jump right in. (laughs) No need to ease into things. I mean, it's a, I'm sure. I mean, are you finding that like what we just have to hit the ground running? It sounds like a lot has already happened in the legislature. And, you know, I mean, I know it's sort of a compacted schedule because you're only there till May. So um, it, uh, what is that like? I mean, it, it doesn't seem like it's very gradual at all. You don't really ease into things. There's absolutely no ease about this job in any way, shape or form. It is all about speed your ability to receive a lot of information and process it so that you can not only be effective in your com- in your committee, but be effective to overall issues that concern your constituency. I'm on the education committee, but I represent three towns. Not everybody has children. Not everybody has children anymore that are in school. So I'm still trying to keep my feet on the ground and that's why I, I visit the issues caucus, because those are that's what affects, I think, our communities the most. And it's exciting to hear those bills and to read those bills and to look at what rural Vermont's priorities are as a whole. Um, but that means, you know, a standing meeting every Thursday morning. It, it means that I've already read probably 400 pages worth of bills to potentially co-sponsor, but also to just educate myself on the priorities that are being put forth this year. So, um, you know, we we have folks that help steer us to say these bills have been coming back and around and back and around and back and around. So this has the likelihood of actually coming up for a vote. You know, 2000 bills will probably get presented and then they go to committee. And then in committee, if it doesn't get picked up, it likely will never come to a vote. So it's really important to manage your time resource and look at at what has the likelihood of, of going all the way through. Um, yeah, so there's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And- Managing calendars and emails with constituents and, and other folks and reading report after report after report so that uh-huh. we can make the best decisions. And does anything really prepare you for for all of that work or that that style of of, of work that, that that level of intensity? I think that nothing can quite prepare you for the accumulation of everything, but I do love uh, I, I do love to just dive in head first and be a little overwhelmed. I I feel really kind of at my fighting weight uh, in those types of situations. But I'm very grateful for the fact that I have managed multiple projects simultaneously throughout my time of being an entrepreneur and a, and an advocate for childcare. So I am used to uh, bouncing to many different topics and that is quite helpful. Um, so uh, we talked to you a week ago today. Uh, what, what's happened since then? What are the, some of the highlights? I know the governor gave his uh, budget address over the course of the week. Um, do you want to touch on that a bit and your your first impressions? Yes, I sure do. Um, this was a really exciting speech. And and I'm going to start with, with a, a, a number. The governor spent, if I've calculated correctly, a million and a half dollars per word of his speech. Now, that was the written word out on the page. He probably spoke more words in in person that I didn't count, but 
Um, but when the speech was put into print, that is, I think, what it was. And and for every one dollar of state funds, there are four dollars of federal funds coming down. So this is an unprecedented time for Vermont. And overall, I believe the governor has has done a very calculated and thoughtful job of figuring out how to invest that money really well. Um, one of the things I'll start with is the Vermont State Colleges, which is now turning into the uh, Vermont University. And so it was in a really challenging state and they now have combined um, so that they can reduce infrastructure, so that they can um, pull all their classes together. They now have what's called in-person plus. So you can come and take your class at your specific location, but then also be connected to all of the other classes that are in the other parts of the state, which is really exciting. The other thing, when they came to speak to the education committee, and what I found most exciting was that the average age is 29. And 70% of the folks that attend the Vermont State University are people who live here in Vermont and stay in Vermont. So we are training folks in jobs um, with the with the Vermont State University more then um, I, I can't say more than UVM, but um, it's a really important part of its mission and it's and it's part of uh, our Vermont success. And other universities are lagging in enrollment and they are actually staying a half a percentage above. So I'm so happy to see that there was a lot of support for that. Um, I also liked the fact that uh, Governor Scott is putting money away so that we can do matching grants in the future. I think that that's what harms a lot of Vermont small businesses is that you go in for a grant and you're supposed to match it by $30,000. And that's that's really challenging for a, for a lot of folks. So I think that is very financially um, prudent and responsible. Um, he did put in a lot of extra money for childcare, which I in general support, of course, because childcare needs all the help it can get. But we still have some real strong work to do on the regular basis. Uh, throwing money at it is only one part of its potential solution. Um, he also put a lot of money into housing, particularly the VHIP program. Uh, VHIP specifically helps create small accessory dwelling units which is, I think, the key to rural Vermont. Um, the, the Woodstock Housing Workforce is, wait, is that, I, I think that that's their title. Um, they are working on what they call invisible infill because everybody wants Vermont to look exactly the way that it is. So this kind of bill helps to create places and apartments where the exterior of the building doesn't uh, isn't adjusted. So you just created housing and nobody knows it. So it's uh, that's a wonderful program, and I'm I'm really happy he threw a lot of money to that. Um, you know, he did propose some tax cuts, and and that's kind of a, a counter to his um, sort of you know save for the future sort of thing because you know a tax cut is forever a tax cut, and so we forever have to um, make sure that we can afford that. Now I don't disagree with why he chose that particular group of folks, the, the veterans and, and social security. But um, it also begs the question of how many other groups will then come forward and ask for the same tax cut. And so that's something we look at a lot. You know, we, we think, um, gosh, let's try to help EMS uh, get recruitment because, you know, we need more folks to volunteer. So let's provide a, a tax credit. Let's provide um, a credit on their property taxes. And then the question always ends up in committee is where does this end? And you have to think about every single group that would request that exemption and that tax reduction and whether or not we as a whole of Vermont can afford that. So to you, the tax cuts is about, um, it sounds like there's a, maybe a danger in the precedent setting. That's right. It's not to say that I don't think our veterans deserve it and our folks on Social Security. I mean, absolutely. Uh, I, I wholeheartedly believe that this help is needed. It, um, But it does make it does always raise that other question. And it's the other question that I look at for a lot of the things we're trying to solve in Vermont. So 
I'm trying to take real strong care and to think about into thinking about the consequences of of the decisions that we make when it's going to cost Vermonters something for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so overall, you would say that uh, it sounds like you're 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 hearing a lot of uh, you have a positive reaction to the governor's address overall. Overall, yes. You know, there was something else he mentioned, which is to, you know, potentially work to bring in more um, immigrants and to train new Americans. And he did that because of workforce. We really need workforce. And, you know, bringing other folks in also provides diversity in our communities, which is also wonderful overall. Um, so I, I appreciated that as well. There was a strong focus in rural Vermont. And in fact, he even mentioned Reading, which is exciting. I did hear that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because Reading is considering, it's a very, very dense downtown community. And, you know, if you need to replace a septic system, the issue is, is that you may not be able to do that. The thing that that building was always permitted to do or have the number of bedrooms in your home that your home was always, uh, at, you know, that you were always ha having in your home because of the limited real estate. And we now have stronger regulations than we did. And, you know, whenever those septic systems were, were put in and most of them, we don't even have actual pay, uh, you know, paper permits for to see how their design was completed because before 2006, you didn't have to register with the state and not everybody registered with the town. So this work in rural development is super important for us to know what we can do for our towns. Uh, it may not be financially prudent to have a, a public water or wastewater system in Reading, but it allows us to study the problem so that we can create alternative solutions if that's not the most viable one. Mm -hmm. And is this, um, I mean, I imagine there must be some parallels with your work on the rural caucus. Are these some of the issues uh, you're looking at infrastructure issues and that kind of thing in the, in the caucus? Yes, we are. We're looking at infrastructure issues. We're looking at, you know, potential storm mitigation, because uh, if we there are some things that towns can can do to to ensure that culverts are installed properly and, and where they need to, to be installed. And that takes a lot of money um, or replacement of bridges and whatnot. So we we definitely look at uh, disaster mitigation and overall rural infrastructure and then housing because a lot of the programs are really designed to help larger scale developers. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's really important to me is to help. How do we help the average person who really could use help taking their huge, you know, 1840s house and dividing it up into two different spaces so that somebody could live, you know, making it a duplex, somebody can live next door because they're really struggling financially. And, and that could make a huge difference. But the process of going through the permits, obtaining the financing, finding the contractors, figuring out how you do the design, submitting them to the Department of Fire Safety, going through the inspections, all of that can be a super overwhelming process. And yet that right now is the best solution and the fastest option to creating more housing and to create creating a, a financial help to those Vermonters. Well, you just touched on something else I wanted to bring up and maybe this would be the, the uh, final note, but um, you know, I do get the, the local papers and I did see your op-ed in the, in the, uh, Mont standard in it where you sort of mentioned the sort of the, some of that onerous process of uh of going through this was specific to the to the act 250 uh process and um you want to talk about um you know what you wrote there in the, in the in the standard and how that relates to i guess this was a directly in response to the peacefield farm situation well i mentioned peacefield farm because it's the latest on farm uh commercial entity that has had the hit the news cycle but I do want to be clear, what my article was focused on is on farm commerce in general. And the fact that the uh, Natural Resources Board is made recommendations to make this process more transparent, 
to train farmers so that they know when they could trigger Act 250 and when they will not trigger Act 250. It helps for farmers to collaborate with one another. So if I have a small farm and I only grow, you know, potatoes and carrots, but next door they grow a lot of different exotic kohlrabi and eggplant and whatnot, I can combine and sell their product and my product to make that farm threshold that's required so that you don't trigger Act 250. And to be clear, Act 250 has, Act 250 is the reason why Vermont looks the way Vermont looks. These criteria are very, very important. But we also could look at the expense that it takes up front to do Act 250. So let me give you an example. When we renovated uh, the building where Rainbow Play School now is housed and a second after school program called the Community Campus is now housed. So we take care of that building from six weeks to 13 years of age. If folks in the 1990s who were incredibly generous had not gone through the Act 250 process for me, all I had to do was an administrative amendment to bring it back into uh, being a school again. But if, if I had to do that project from scratch, that permit would have cost me $53,000 on top of the permits I would need for the Department of Public Safety for fire and sprinkler and egress and all of that. And our lawyer said, I will not let you close on this building until all of your permits are in place because we need to make sure that this is a sound investment for this small nonprofit to have their own permanent home and own a building. And he was right. But if I had to put out $53,000 up front just to see if I could qualify under Act 250 to open the school, I don't think we would have made that gamble. And then I look at, we want small businesses here in this state, but is the upfront cost of that permit prohibitively expensive to the tune that it will actually keep out the folks that we really, really want for because it, it only the folks that can up, have that kind of cash up front that you can't borrow from a bank, only those folks will be able to develop here. That's my concern. And so I think people need to have a, a greater understanding of Act 250, and that's the reason why I wrote that, specifically for farm businesses. But I think overall, we need to learn about the permitting process as well. It's not about wanting to uh, you know, take away that, that regulation. A lot of that regulation is very, very important. But I would like to find a way for small business owners to be able to, to come in and not have that upfront cost be so expensive, because that's, that's the gamble. Sounds like there's a lot of opportunity for, um, I, you know, I'm sure your view is probably shared by others in the legislature and, and, and it echoes a little bit of what you hear from the governor. It sounds like there could be a lot of opportunity to work together. I sure do hope so. Um, I, you know, I, I have uh, some meetings set up with, uh, you know, moving forward with some folks that right now I'm just trying to gain information. I see things from my little small business and, you know, childcare advocacy perspective, but I really want to do my research and and speak to you know the Vermont um, League of Cities and Towns and see how they you know they provide a lot of feedback to the rural caucus. I want to speak to other small business owners. I want to speak to other farmers. I want to speak to big big business owners. So right now the advocacy work I'm doing is if you have had an experience that you want to share, that's what I need right now. I need testimony that's not in committee. I just need testimony that's that's to me so I can um, accumulate it all together and put something to a committee to be discussed. Great. I guess we'll leave it there. And uh, and we know uh, how, to, how, to, how to reach you. Uh, we'll put uh, Representative Buss's contact information there on, on the screen and uh, through the, the legislative uh, email address there. And if anybody has a question, um, I guess send, send it your way. That sounds great. Thank okay. you for this uh, time, Patrick. You bet. And um, I swear, one of these times we will be joined by Tom Ayers of the Vermont Standard. Um, uh, he was not able to make it today, but uh, we're looking to start that next week. So um, 
We'll, we'll keep you posted and um, look forward to having you back. Excellent. I look forward to it.